Are you noticing that your eyelids are starting to sag and droop or seeing deeper wrinkles around your eyes? Are you concerned that your eyes are looking more tired and are looking for ways to freshen them up? I'm Dr. Michael Chua. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist with Puente Hills Eye Care. And in this video, I'll talk about the best ways to prevent and treat aging eyelids. First, we need to understand the anatomic changes that occur around our eyes during the aging process. Once we figure out the mechanisms responsible for eyelid aging, we can begin to develop the best ways to decrease their appearance. So these pictures are from the American Academy of Ophthalmology of a woman and her daughter. Now, if I asked you to guess their age, how would you go about that? Several research studies have shown that our brains naturally direct our attention to someone's eyes first when we look at them. And that's how we naturally extract key information for facial processing, such as figuring out who they are, their race, their sex, and their age. So let's look at mom for a second. What aspects of her face did you focus on first to gather information about her? If you're like most people, you probably focus first on her eyes, then secondarily factored in her mouth and her nose. And when you looked into her eyes and orbital area, what features did you analyze to estimate her age? Maybe you noticed deeper lines and wrinkles on her face, sagging of upper eyelid skin, relative thinning of her eyebrows. Before I reveal both of their ages, keep that number in your mind of what your guess would be. At the time of these photos, daughter is 32 and mom is 65. How close was your guess? So first, I want to help you think like a doctor or a researcher or a surgeon by deconstructing the specific eye changes that occur with aging and what causes them. Then we can intelligently come up with ways to prevent and treat these changes. One of the most common changes we see in the eyelids with aging is excess sagging skin in the upper eyelid. This excess skin creates a hood in the upper eyelid. The medical term for this is dermatochalasis. As we age, our bodies produce less collagen and elastin, which can lead to skin that's less elastic, so it's less able to bounce back after stretching. This can cause the skin to become loose and excess skin to accumulate, particularly in areas such as the upper eyelids where the skin is thinner and more prone to sagging. In addition to the natural aging process, other factors such as sun exposure and smoking can also contribute to collagen and elastin loss, leading to the development of dermatochalasis and other signs of skin aging. Another eyelid change commonly associated with aging is ptosis or drooping of the upper eyelid. This is a little bit different than dermatochalasis because dermatochalasis is drooping of the eyelid skin, whereas ptosis is drooping of the upper eyelid itself. The most common type of ptosis in older adults is called aponeurotic ptosis. Let's get a closer look at the eyelid anatomy to understand why we often see droopy eyelids with aging. There's a special muscle called the levator papabri superioris which is often referred to as the levator muscle. The levator muscle connects to the fleshy part of the upper eyelid called the tarsus. So as the levator muscle contracts, it lifts the upper eyelid upwards. The muscle itself is connected to the upper eyelid through a thin fibrous band called an aponeurosis. This aponeurosis serves as the main support structure that allows the eyelid to stay open. With aging, this band of tissue can become weakened and stretched, leading to a loss of tension and drooping of the eyelid. Besides aging, other factors like chronic use of contact lenses or frequent eye rubbing have been shown in research studies to weaken this aponeurosis and also cause drooping of the eyelid. You can see in this picture, we have the levator muscle and the levator aponeurosis connecting to the fleshy part of the upper eyelid. This is what a normal eyelid looks like. In a patient who maybe is a little bit older, the aponeurosis is thinned out and weakened, causing the eyelid to droop and sag. The next age-related change that we often see around the eyelids is the development of rightids or wrinkles. They're often located in the forehead or along the lateral orbit and radiate outwards, kind of like footprints left behind by a crow. Over time, these wrinkles can become more prominent, giving the appearance of crow's feet. Research has shown that there are several different processes that occur in the skin that contribute to the appearance of deeper and more prominent wrinkles. When we're younger, there's a relatively larger amount of elastin, collagen, and hyaluronic acid found in the dermis layer of the skin. These special compounds keep skin supple and elastic. With time though, levels of elastin, collagen, and hyaluronic acid all decrease, which contributes to loss of structural integrity and elasticity of our skin. These natural changes in skin structure, as well as other environmental causes, such as chronic sun and UV ray exposure, all cause the development of wrinkles in the skin. The next change around the eyelids that is often seen with aging is the development of puffy under eye bags. I made an in-depth review about eye bags in a previous video, so if you want to learn more about how to get rid of eye bags, you can watch that video here. 
But briefly, we all have what's called periorbital fat, or pockets of fat located in compartments around the eye. But as we all get older, the muscles and tissue that's supposed to be keeping the fat in its place loses its tightness and strength. And as it loosens, that fat can herniate forward. As that tissue weakens and the fat herniates forward, we can see more prominent eye bags. Here's an example of a patient in which you can see that the periorbital fat in the lower eyelid appears to be protruding forward, giving the appearance of prominent eye bags. Okay, now that we've deconstructed the most common ways in which the eyelids change with aging, we can think about the most effective ways to try to prevent these changes from occurring. Now, just to be clear, many of these changes, like the eventual development of wrinkles and the gradual sagging of skin, they're going to happen naturally with time. And there's absolutely nothing inherently wrong with that. But there's a lot of people and patients who ask me every day about the most effective and safe ways to halt or prevent these eyelid changes as much as possible. So let's discuss some of the research-backed ways to do so. One of the most important and effective ways to prevent dermatocalasis and wrinkles is UV protection. Those harsh ultraviolet rays from the sun can damage the DNA and skin cells as well as break down collagen and elastin in our skin. So good UV protection is an absolute must in preventing signs of aging. Three important ways to protect your eyelid skin from harsh UV rays are sunglasses, sunscreen, and a wide brim hat. For sunglasses, you want to make sure that the ones you use are UV blocking. And the shape of the frame matters too. Regular sunglass frames usually leave the temple area exposed, but as we discussed earlier, that area is particularly vulnerable to developing deep wrinkles and crow's feet. So getting a nice pair of wraparound sunglasses that provide good protection to the temple area are important. In terms of sunscreen, you want to make sure you use at least SPF 30. That's because SPF 30 sunscreen blocks 96.7 of UV rays from reaching the skin. Compare this to SPF 15, which blocks only 93% of UV radiation. There's no harm in using stronger sunscreens with higher SPF, but SPF 30 is a good minimum baseline, which is most commonly recommended by dermatologists. So that's the number you want to remember. One problem with sunscreen I've always struggled with is that sometimes when I apply sunscreen around my eyes, especially if I start to sweat a little bit, is that my eyes can sting. They become red, irritated, and they start tearing. And that's because some chemicals found in many sunscreens have been shown to cause severe eye irritation. Two of the most common offenders are oxybenzone and avobenzone. So those are two ingredients you'll want to avoid when looking for sunscreens for your face. Generally, mineral-based sunscreens which use primarily minerals such as zinc oxide and titanium dioxide to protect the skin are safer for use around the eyes. But the thing to keep in mind with these types of sunscreens is that they're generally thicker, pastier, and take a little bit more effort to rub into the skin. Another secret I recommend, especially if you've had eye burning with other sunscreens, is to use baby sunscreen around the eyes. Baby sunscreens are usually formulated to be tear-free so that you can be used to provide great UV protection without the eye-related side effects. And they're usually reasonably priced as well, so that's an added bonus. Lastly, wide-brimmed hats, especially for beach days or days where you may be spending a lot of time outdoors with increased sun exposure, are a great way to provide some more UV protection to the areas around your eyes. This photo published in the New England Journal of Medicine is a great example of the effects of chronic sun exposure to your skin. This photo was taken of a 69-year-old truck driver who had spent 25 years driving trucks. And since he had been driving trucks for so long, and because of where the driver's seat is located in cars and trucks, the left side of his face received significantly more UV exposure compared to the right side of his face. So you can see that along the left side of his face, the deeper wrinkles and lines that have formed over time. And so this photograph is a pretty striking example of the photo aging that can be caused by UV exposure. So it's a good reminder to keep your face protected from UV damage. Okay, so besides UV protection, how else can we keep our eyes looking young and healthy? The next way to prevent these eyelid changes is to keep the skin moisturized. When the skin around our eyelids dry out, wrinkles and fine lines can become more apparent. When you rehydrate and moisturize your skin, the moisture helps give your skin a more supple and smooth appearance. You don't have to break the bank and buy expensive eye creams with fancy marketing claims. Just get a good quality moisturizer like the CeraVe Moisturizing Cream and use it daily to keep your eyelids and face moisturized. And full disclosure, I don't have any financial relationship with any of these product manufacturers. My recommendations are based on my own personal experiences and the experiences of my patients. Another way to try to maintain a youthful appearance for your eyes is to cut down on alcohol intake. Alcohol is a diuretic and it dehydrates your skin. That can make the skin around your eyelids flabby and make wrinkles and fine lines more noticeable. Another important way that alcohol contributes to aging skin is that it hijacks the retinol and vitamin A pathways. 
Vitamin A refers to a family of compounds including retinol, retinaldehyde, and retinoic acid. These compounds are involved in skin cell turnover as well as the production of collagen and elastin, two proteins that are essential for maintaining skin elasticity and a youthful appearance. These vitamin A compounds are primarily stored in the liver where they're processed by specific enzymes. When we drink alcohol or ethanol, these enzymes, which are usually responsible for vitamin A processing, get diverted to metabolizing the alcohol instead, leading to skin that's less elastic and more prone to wrinkles and fine lines. Several studies have shown the relationship between chronic alcohol use and decreased vitamin A levels in the body. And the decreased availability of vitamin A in our bodies could lead to earlier development of skin aging. Vitamin A and retinoid compounds have been shown in multiple randomized control trials to decrease fine wrinkles and decrease the appearance of skin aging. Researchers have found that in addition to stimulating production of elastin and collagen, topical retinol also stimulates the production of glucosaminoglycans, which are special compounds that are hydrophilic, meaning they attract and retain water, giving your skin that plump, youthful appearance. Now, while we're on the topic of retinols and wrinkles, one question I often get asked is whether it's safe to use retinols around the eyes to prevent the development of wrinkles. First, let's discuss oral isotretinoin or Accutane, which is a retinoid medication that is often prescribed to treat more severe forms of acne. Retinoids are effective in treating acne because they have been shown in research studies to decrease the size and function of sebaceous glands in the body. Sebaceous glands are glands in the skin that are responsible for producing oil, but when they get clogged and inflamed, then we can develop pimples and acne. So when patients take Accutane, the medication causes sebaceous cell apoptosis, or basically causes cell death of these sebaceous glands in order to downregulate oil production and to improve the appearance of skin. And although controlling sebaceous cell activity is very effective in treating acne, there are other secondary effects. The problem is we also have specialized sebaceous glands in our eyelids called meibomian glands. And these meibomian glands serve an essential function. They secrete oil onto the eyes to prevent our tears from evaporating. Multiple studies have shown that taking oral retinoids causes cell death and atrophy, not only of the sebaceous glands in our face, but it also causes atrophy of the meibomian glands in our eyelids. And this results in a high prevalence of dry eye disease in patients who have used retinoids. And depending on how long and what dosage patients are on Accutane, these effects of dry eye can be permanent. These side effects are particularly relevant to me because I took Accutane for acne when I was in college. And ever since then, I've personally suffered from dry eye. And after I took the Accutane, I actually never really made the connection between the medication and dry eye because my dermatologist actually didn't discuss that possible side effect with me prior to treatment. So whatever, I continued to have dry eye. Then fast forward 10 years later, and I'm in an ophthalmology conference where a sales rep is demoing this lipid scan device, which is a device which can take a scan through your meibomian glands. This is a report of my results. In a normal scan, you can see that my bomian glands are usually about three to four millimeters. They're long, straight, and uniform. In my scan, and in other patients with my bomian gland dysfunction, you can see that these glands become distorted and torturous instead of straight. There's significant shortening and atrophy of the glands, and some of the glands just die and drop out altogether. So when the sales rep saw my my bomian gland results, he immediately asked me if I had any medical conditions or took any medications. And that's when I realized that it's likely my history of Accutane use which probably caused some permanent damage to my meibomian glands and helped explain why I had dry eye throughout my 20s. So because of my own personal experience, I am much more cautious about the effects of either systemic retinoids such as Accutane taken in pill form or even topical retinoids such as retinol creams and ointments anywhere remotely close to your eyelids. Although there have been quite a few research studies published about the relationship between oral retinoids and dry eye, there haven't been any studies on the effects of topical retinoid creams or ointments on dry eye disease. It is plausible though that if you apply a high enough dosage of topical retinoids onto the eyelids for a long enough treatment period that you can induce similar destructive effects to the meibomian glands and cause evaporative dry eye disease. So if you do use topical retinoids for their anti-aging properties, I'd recommend keeping at least a two finger width safety zone away from your eyelids where you do not apply any topical retinoids to avoid the potential side effect of meibomian gland atrophy and dry eye disease. And if you suffer from significant dry eye disease already, you may want to avoid retinoids altogether to prevent worsening of your dry eye disease. But again, in terms of clinical research, the relationship between topical retinoids and dry eye disease seems to be a question that hasn't quite been answered yet. So I think it's a great research opportunity for collaboration between dermatology, pathology, and ophthalmology to figure out a way to come up with guidelines on how to use retinoids for their proven anti-aging properties 
while also minimizing the risk of dry eye disease. Okay, so we've talked about UV protection, alcohol use, and retinoids. The next topic we'll discuss for preventing changes for eyelid skin aging is sleep. One of the best ways to prevent eyelid wrinkles, eye bags, and sagging skin is to get good sleep. Many studies have shown that there's a lot of restorative processes that occur for your skin while you sleep. Sleep deprivation is associated with fine lines in the skin, dehydration, uneven pigmentation, and reduced elasticity. The skin on your eyelid is about half a millimeter. It's the thinnest skin on your entire body. So if you have changes in your skin architecture from sleep deprivation, it will be most obvious in your eyelids. One of the most effective ways to help the appearance of your eyes is to get plenty of good quality sleep, around seven to nine hours each night. The next tip to avoid premature aging of your skin is to avoid smoking. At this point, it's probably been beaten to death, but multiple research studies have shown that smoking causes premature aging of your skin. Smoking increases levels of a family of enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases, or MMPs. And MMPs result in the breakdown of collagen and elastin, which cause degradation of skin tissue. Smoking also increases reactive oxygen species in the body, which have been shown to cause premature skin aging. The last preventative tips I'll talk about to keeping your eyelids looking young are ways you can prevent eyelid ptosis. As we discussed before, one of the most common eyelid changes we can see with aging is drooping of the eyelids. And that eyelid drooping is often caused by weakening of the muscles and tissue holding the eyelid up. Some common causes of eyelid ptosis are frequent eye rubbing as well as chronic contact lens wear because these activities can accelerate the weakening of our levator aponeurosis. So if you do have a tendency to have itchy eyelids and rub them a lot, go and see your ophthalmologist to see if they can set you up on some sort of antihistamine regimen for relief. Now, in terms of contact lens wear, a review published in the Journal of Craniofacial Surgery assessed all the prior studies on contact lens wear and the development of eyelid ptosis. They found that after tallying all the good quality studies together, Patients with a history of hard contact lens wear had a 17.38 times increase in the odds of developing ptosis, while soft contact lens wearers had an 8.12 times increase in the odds of developing ptosis. So anyone who wears contact lenses, particularly if they've worn them for several hours a day for many years, should know that they have a significantly increased risk of developing droopy eyelids. So if you wear contact lenses and you notice that your eyelids are already starting to droop, you may want to consider decreasing contact lens usage to prevent further eyelid drooping or ptosis. Okay, so we've discussed lifestyle modification and different things you can do to try to prevent the development of age-related eyelid changes. But if you notice that you already have dermatocolasis or sagging upper eyelid skin or ptosis or crow's feet or some 11s in between your eyebrows and you want some definitive treatment to decrease their appearance, Let's discuss the different treatment options. And before we get into the different treatments, let me mention again that there's nothing wrong with aging naturally. When patients ask me whether they need this surgery or that injection, the most common response I give is, no, you don't need to do any of these procedures. I understand that it's all subjective, but to me, there's nothing inherently bad or ugly about the skin changes associated with aging. But having said that, as long as patients have realistic expectations about their surgery, Many patients who have had eyelid procedures report improved self-esteem and self-confidence following the procedure. For example, a study from the Journal of Craniofacial Surgery in 2022 found that 96% of patients who underwent blepharoplasty felt better about themselves and 94% would do the procedure again. So a very high satisfaction rate with the procedure. What I'll also add is that I also commonly perform these surgeries for their functional benefit. That is, some patients have dermatocolasis that is so severe with their upper eyelid skin sagging so low that they need to tape their eyelids up just to be able to see the world in front of them. Or some people with ptosis have to start using this chin up position just so that their pupils aren't covered by their eyelids. And so when there's dermatocolasis or ptosis causing loss of a patient's visual field, then it can become very inconvenient or frankly dangerous if they can't see what they're doing. Patients often complain that they may be having trouble driving or putting dishes away or watching TV because the top half of their vision is totally obscured. And in those cases, I routinely offer and recommend surgery as a great treatment option. The other important thing to remember is that if your upper eyelids block enough of your vision to significantly affect your daily activities, then the surgeries may be covered by insurance. Okay, so let's go through each change one by one and discuss what treatment options are available for them. For dermatocolasis, the definitive treatment option is surgery with an upper eyelid blepharoplasty. Now, there are other treatment options that may get marketed like lasers or injections with filler, but the underlying problem in dermatocolasis is excess sagging skin. So the most effective way to treat it is to surgically remove that excess sagging skin. And that's exactly what you do with the blepharoplasty. 
During an upper eyelid blepharoplasty, we mark the eyelids to plan how much skin we'll remove. We make sure to mark the eyelids in a way to preserve the natural lid crease and make sure not to remove too much skin that it might pull the eyebrow down or cause an inability to close the eyelids. Then we inject lidocaine and epinephrine to numb the area and to prevent bruising. Then we remove the skin and depending on the patient's anatomy, sometimes we'll remove some extra fat tissue to also help treat the medial orbital fat bulging that some patients might have. After that, we close up the incision with sutures and usually have the patient come back after about a week to remove the sutures. It's normal to have swelling and bruising for the first few weeks after surgery. Usually, the majority of the swelling and bruising improves after about two to three weeks, although it usually takes a few months for the swelling to totally resolve and for the eyelids to fully heal. With this procedure, we can achieve excellent outcomes in a safe and predictable way. There's usually a little bit of scarring with the upper lid blepharoplasty, but it's hidden in the upper lid crease and usually not very noticeable. The next treatment option I'll discuss is ptosis repair. Now, when patients come in with a complaint of sagging hooded eyelid skin, it's critical that we surgeons also evaluate for underlying ptosis. Because as we discussed previously, those are two separate eye problems. Dermatocalasis is caused by excess sagging skin, while ptosis or droopy eyelid is usually caused by weakness in the muscle and tissue responsible for holding the eyelid up. So dermatocalasis can be treated with an upper eyelid blepharoplasty, but ptosis correction requires a totally different surgical approach. That's why it's important to go to a surgeon who really understands all the relevant anatomy and feels comfortable with all the surgical techniques for these problems. Because if someone takes the one size fits all approach to eyelid surgery, you're gonna get unsatisfactory outcomes. So for fixing ptosis, we have two main surgical approaches. The first type of surgery is through what we call an internal approach. Through this method, we flip the eyelid to get access to the internal or posterior structures that help hold the eyelid up. We then use an incision to tighten the muscle tendons holding the eyelid up. There's also usually an internal dissolvable suture with some suture knots on the outside of the eyelid which dissolves after a couple of weeks. Since the incision is made on the inside, there's no visible scar after surgery. This method of ptosis repair is a very reliable and predictable option and it's usually reserved for cases of mild to moderate ptosis because it can be used to lift the eyelid up to about three millimeters. For cases of more severe ptosis, where you'll need to lift the eyelid maybe four millimeters or more, or in cases where patients may have already tried an internal ptosis repair in the past, but still have ptosis, then surgeons commonly opt for an external approach with what's called the external levator advancement. Like we mentioned before, one of the most common causes of ptosis is stretching and weakening of the tenderness attachment of the levator muscle in the upper eyelid known as the levator aponeurosis. In this surgery, we make an external incision to gain access to the upper eyelid muscles. We then use sutures to reattach the fleshy part of the upper eyelid called the tarsus to a stronger part of the levator muscle so that it can hold up the upper eyelid more effectively. Since we're making this incision externally, there's usually a little bit of visible scarring with the procedure, but we're usually able to hide the scar in the natural lid crease so it's often not noticeable. The benefit of this approach is that we can correct cases of severe ptosis in a reliable and predictable way. And since we're already making an incision on the external eyelid, we can also combine the surgery with an upper eyelid blepharoplasty to treat both dermatocalasis and ptosis at the same time. The post-op course is similar to that of an upper eyelid blepharoplasty. There will be some sutures on the outside that eventually get removed about a week after surgery. And there's going to be some swelling and bruising that improves significantly over the first two to three weeks and full healing after about a few months. There's also a non-surgical treatment option for ptosis that was released recently in the US. It's actually an eye drop called Upneak. The active ingredient in Upneak is oxymetazolin, which belongs to a class of medications we call sympathomimetics. This means that it activates the muscles in our eyelids that usually respond to the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is stimulated by hormones like adrenaline and is responsible for our fight or flight response. One of the physiologic changes we see in response to adrenaline is activation and contraction of our upper eyelid muscles, which raises the upper eyelid. So Upneak or oxymetazolin activates the sympathetic receptors in our eyelid muscles, causing our upper eyelid to elevate temporarily. Now, the eye drop usually works for about six to eight hours. It's also not covered by insurance and a one month supply costs around $150. I think Upneak makes sense for patients who may want a temporary lift, maybe for an event like a wedding or conference. But since its effects are only temporary, the costs add up quickly if you use the drops for a longer period of time. The next treatment option I'll discuss is the treatment for lower eye bags. The most definitive treatment for eye bags is lower eyelid blepharoplasty. I go into much greater detail in my previous video on eye bags, 
But briefly, at our practice, we usually perform lower lid blepharoplasty to treat eye bags using an internal transconjunctival approach, meaning that we make an incision in the conjunctiva or the soft pink tissue lining the eyes in order to gain access to the periorbital fat. Then the fat is removed using a combination of scissors and cautery. Through this technique, we're able to obtain natural looking results for patients in a safe and predictable way. Since the incision is made on the internal side of the eyelids, there's no visible scarring after the surgery. Okay, so we talked about upper eyelid blepharoplasty for dermatochalasis, internal or external ptosis repair, hydrosphertosis, and lower eyelid blepharoplasty. Now let's talk about addressing those rightids or wrinkles that can form around our eyes. One of the most effective ways to treat the fine lines around our eyes is with injections of Botox. Botox is a medication that can be used to temporarily weaken or paralyze certain muscles. Treatments usually last for about three months. Botox is particularly useful at treating the 11s or the vertical lines between our eyebrows or the crow's feet or the lines at the corners of our eyes. It also does a great job at melting away the wrinkles in our forehead. The tricky part with Botox is that it's a delicate balance. The muscles around our eyes and upper face work together to maintain the proper position and contour of our eyebrows. The muscles we usually inject in the upper face are the frontalis muscle in the forehead, the corrugator and procerus muscles in between our eyebrows, and the orbicularis oculi muscle on the lateral side. The frontalis muscle works to lift the eyebrow, while the corrugator, procerus, and orbicularis muscles all work to lower or drop the eyebrow. So if you get injected in any of these areas to treat wrinkles, the injector has to be mindful of the reactions that will occur. For example, some patients ask, can I just treat the wrinkles in the forehead here? And we have to be very careful because if you are now injecting the frontalis muscle to get rid of forehead wrinkles, you're paralyzing the only muscle which lifts the eyebrows up. Then the depressors or the muscles which make the eyebrow go down will be working unopposed. So there's a risk that the brow could drop and make you look upset all the time. Another common mistake is that many injectors are taught not to inject on the lateral forehead to avoid dropping the lateral brow. And at first glance, this makes sense because if you accidentally drop the lateral brow, it can make someone's face look sad and grumpy, even if they're not. The problem with that technique is that if they paralyze the medial forehead and maybe inject a little bit too low on the frontalis, then you're effectively dropping the medial brow while allowing the lateral frontalis to still be able to raise the lateral brow. This can create a very unnatural Spock look. This is why it's very important that if you're considering Botox that you go to someone who really understands the underlying anatomy of the face. Because even if the primary goal is to help melt away fine lines and wrinkles, keep in mind that the secondary effect of paralyzing certain muscles will change the shape and contour of your face and eyebrows. So you want to make sure you go to an injector who will be able to anticipate these changes and help you shape your face and eyelids to the way that you prefer. Okay, so that was a thorough review of the best ways to prevent and treat the changes associated with aging around your eyes. In summary, some of the most prominent changes we see with aging are dermatochalasis, which is sagging of excess upper eyelid skin, ptosis or drooping of the upper eyelid, more prominent lower eye bags and prolapse of lower eyelid fat, and the development of rightids or wrinkles and fine lines. The best way to prevent these changes are UV protection with sunscreen, aim for SPF 30 or stronger, wrap around sunglasses, a good moisturizer like CeraVe moisturizing cream, it doesn't need to be one of those expensive fancy eye creams, getting good quality sleep, avoiding alcohol and smoking, and consider stopping contact lens use if you have ptosis. The most definitive treatments for these changes if you already have them are upper eyelid blepharoplasty for dermatochalasis, Upper eyelid ptosis repair for upper eyelid ptosis, although opnique eye drops may be used to provide temporary eyelid lifts. Lower eyelid blepharoplasty for eye bags and Botox for the treatment of wrinkles. I think that's enough information for this video, but if you're in the Los Angeles, Orange County or Inland Empire area and are interested in any of the procedures above or want a consultation about your eyelids, feel free to visit our website or give our phone number a call today. I'm happy to share my expertise and advice with you to help you look great and feel great too. I'm Dr. Michael Chua with Puente Hills Eye Care. See you next time.